Welcome to Global Access. I'm Ian Martin. And today I'm going to be talking to Cory Shaki about the prospect of saving, rescuing the American-led world order. Past and Present is the title of this year's edition of Global Access. Is it possible to draw conclusions from past events? Or is man doomed to repeat the mistakes of yesterday? How do authoritarian regimes use their own country's history to secure power? And what role does the individual play? In these interviews, researchers, journalists and writers try to answer these questions. Cory Shaki is the vice president of the think tank International Institute for Strategic Studies and has previously worked with George W. Bush. In conversation with Ian Martin, Shaki argues that the United States is the country with the best conditions to defend the liberal democratic world order from China and Russia's power claims. Cory Shaki, welcome. Thank you. Now, the question, uh, really, the first question I have is about the nature of the American world order. If it needs saving, something has gone very badly wrong. Uh, what is it? Why is it in trouble? So I think there are uh, three reasons it's in trouble. The first is uh, the talk about great power competition is returned because there is a rise in great power. And uh, throughout history, there's only one instance of a dominant rule giving and enforcing power peacefully giving way to a rising challenger. And that's the transition between British and American hegemony in the late 1890s. With the rise of China, we are consumed with this question again about uh, what does it mean for international order? Will China sustain the rules that all of us are more or less comfortable with? Or, as appears increasingly evident, does China want a different set of rules that they feel more advantageous to them? So that's the first factor. The second factor is a, a weariness on the part of the United States that I think President Trump is a, an example of, but not the main motive force on. A sort of sense of weariness that this feels hard and it doesn't feel like others are as much help, given that they too are beneficiaries of the order. And I think this is a kind of natural consequence. We are still playing out under the long shadow of the mistakes of the Iraq war and the financial crisis in 2008. So it feels hard. People would like uh, to shirk this burden and have others. And the third, the liberal international order, we take so much of it for granted uh, that you know youngsters talking about socialism being their preferred form of government. This is the recklessness that comes from a long span of peace and prosperity. And so uh, when, for example, uh, Donald Trump went to London on a state visit recently and Jeremy Corbyn uh, boycotted the state dinner and the Speaker of the House of Commons refused to have Donald Trump speak because he's a racist, and yet those same people celebrated Xi Jinping, uh, who has a million Uyghur in concentration camps and is producing an enormously repressive surveillance state, right? So there's actually no moral equivalency between the kind of world order that China is trying to propagate and the one that the United States created in which um, the, the United States um, voluntarily limited its own power by creating rules and embedding them in institutions. And that has made the American order cost effective because most states voluntarily opt into the order and play by the rules because it's beneficial to them. That American stepping back, a retrenchment, is that really all about President Trump or does it predate him? It's a great question, and your suspicion is exactly right. Uh, the stylistic differences between President Obama and President Trump uh, 
shield the actuality that both of them are retrenching presidents. Both of them believe the United States is militarily overcommitted in the Middle East. Both of them believe that America's allies are taking enough responsibility and are strong enough and wealthy enough and influential enough to do a lot more that the United States might do a lot less. The one difference between President Trump and President Obama is a practice of retrenchment is President Obama believed that international institutions and international agreements were um, a good webbing for pushing allies forward and that will allow the United States to step back. Whereas President Trump is almost gleefully destructive of both institutions and international agreements. On, on Trump, is that, is that simply... Uh, is that simply his instinct or his gut or is there a work through philosophical analysis of, of, of why he's doing this, do you think? Or is it just an impulsive rejection of a rules-based order? So I wouldn't go so far as to suggest that President Trump has a philosophy of governance or a philosophy of the international order. But he does have core beliefs that have been consistent for 50 years. He was writing about them in the 1980s. Right, a fundamental... Taking out adverts about nuclear disarmament exactly in the 1980s. Exactly right, yeah. exactly right. So, I mean, there are sort of three big elements to how President Trump thinks about the world. The first is that America's allies are more burden than benefit to the United States and have been taking advantage of the United States in a way that we shouldn't tolerate. The second is that the United States made a series of trade agreements, largely with our friends, but also with uh, other countries, that are more advantageous to others than to, we, than to the United States, and that the U.S. ought to use its power to coerce friends and adversaries into better deals. And third, that immigration is overwhelming the United States and taking American jobs, right? He fundamentally doesn't understand the notion of an expanding pie um, and the creativity and the business acumen that the kind of people who would choose to emigrate bring to the United States. So if this American retreat is now, it's not a new phenomenon and it's now been going on for more than a decade, uh, arguably sort of the, in the Bush second term as well because of what had happened with Iraq. So it's a process of, of more than uh, a decade. Ca is it conceivable that it can be turned around by a, a, by a future American president? Would it, uh, is it possible that American voters would elect someone who was all, who was all for leading um, in the old style again? Yes. One of the things I know as a historian of the 19th century is that Americans aren't newly a country full of crazy people run by reckless politicians. We are almost, we have almost always been a country full of crazy people run by reckless politicians. And the nature of a presidential system, especially one with congressional elections every two years, is that we are tied much more closely to public attitudes than parliamentary systems tie the leadership to public attitudes. So you get more volubility in American politics than you tend to get in others. And there is, this is not the first time we have uh, had this experience. You know, President Eisenhower in 1956 had a conversation with John Foster Dulles in which they agreed that the NATO bargain had run its course and the United States needed to find some new way to engage the international order. Uh, I believe we begin to see already those attitudes changing. My theory of the case about President Trump's election is that um, he's such an interesting political, uh, uh, political raconteur, right? He, his experiment that people felt like elites weren't listening, and they were really worried about how the economy is changing and the way this American society is changing. Um, and no politician was speaking either to their fears or to what they were going to do about it. And President Trump, candidate Trump, spoke to people's anxieties. But I think what we are seeing, uh, and the data comes from polls by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, for example, that does polling of American attitudes on foreign policy issues. 
and you've seen an enormous swing in the first two years of the Trump presidency, 15 percentage points change away from the president's attitudes on immigration, on trade, and on allies. So my theory of the case is that the president's brilliant at asking first-order questions. Why don't America's allies do more for their own defense? Um, and the answers he has posited, either he hasn't posited answers or he hasn't posited um, policy solutions that people feel comfortable with. So if you look at the polling data and the Chicago Council attitudes, not surprisingly, my mom and other Americans actually feel comfortable and safe when we have friends in the world and those friends think we're doing the right things and we can get them to join with us on things that we think are important to do in the world. And now that people have had two years of watching President Trump's immigration policies, they're actually moving in opposition. I think there's quite a strong consensus in the United States that we don't have control of our southern border but um, there is a very quickly shifting public attitude that most Americans don't feel comfortable with the president's solutions to that problem. And what about their attitude to his style, which manifests itself in, 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 in foreign affairs as well, but also domestically? Because you, I'm very struck as someone who visits America a lot and talks to a lot of Americans, is that regardless of political affiliation or party affiliation, Americans like to feel proud of their president and they like to feel proud of how that yeah. person carries it off in the outside world. Do you sense the, this unease even among Republicans about the way in which he conducts himself? Uh, and that's presumably going to figure in the next election. So the American economy is doing very well at the moment. The president's approval ratings lag the economy by um, a lot. So he's never been over 50% approval rating. He hovers about 40%. That's historically incredibly low for an American president with a good economy. And I think that differential goes to um, you know, the president's behavior. And the third, and I think most interesting data point, is that um, in states that President Obama carried in 2012, but President Trump People voted for President Trump in 2016. The president's approval ratings have dropped 19 points in those states. And I think a lot of that had, some of it has to do with policy issues like the stridency of the president's border enforcement and the choices about the travel ban, but it's also much more general stylistic, all right? People don't respond well to talking about the press as the enemy of the people. It feels a lot more like something the Chinese government would say than an American president should say. Mm. But would you expect someone taking on Trump to talk about the, the stuff that we've been talking about, about the Western alliance and about the security structure? Yes, because there's so much low-hanging fruit for a potential opponent of the president to, to make people feel more comfortable by saying, I'm going to, I value America's allies. I'm going to strengthen NATO, not weaken it. I'm going to rejoin the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership because that's how we manage a rising China. We're rule setters. That's what's good about America and the world. There's a lot of easy pickup there. And just about every um, Democrat over the age of 45 is running for president. And the 28 or so major candidates Every single one of them is arrayed in that way, even those that favor retrenchment. So uh, d um, pulling out of the Middle East, even they are saying we need to do this slowly in consultation with our allies. So even those who support some of President Trump's policy choices in the foreign arena are arguing the way he's doing it is unnecessarily costly and damaging. Do you think if you get a potentially a, sh a, sh a shift under Trump in a second term if, um, if he appoints different people or events lead him to behave in a different way, or if you get a change of president who is, who's interested in talking about the world in a different way, is it feasible then to save or to rebuild this American-led world order? What would you practically like to see? Yeah, 
So yes, I do think it's possible. The order's a lot more resilient than we are giving it credit for. Uh, one of my favorite NATO experts, Stanley Sloan from the Congressional Research Service, wrote a great book in the 1980s in which he said that the three oldest refrains in the West are NATO's in crisis, deterrence is breaking down, and we need new thinking. Uh, but that's also, this is what free societies do, right? We identify problems, we argue about it, we're anxious about uh, different choices and different directions and what we see happening. And then we build a foundation of common approach to it. You know, the brittleness of non-market economies and the brittleness, and it parallels into the brittleness of authoritarian societies. Free societies are messy, and especially my own is particularly contentious. And that's the way we are as a, as a body politic, and it's the way we designed our political structures. But uh, there's such a strong consensus about free markets and representative government in the West in a way that would make it very difficult, for example, for the British government to genuinely ally with China and build a different kind of order. So I think part of the reason the British government is so, um, feels like they have their hand in a vice on the Huawei 5G decision is that they want to make a decision to proceed with Chinese technology, but they understand the price that they will pay economically and in political and security relationships if they do. And it's it's a really difficult problem for the British, isn't it? Isn't it? Because post-financial crisis, the British make a big bet on China and on London, the city of yes. London being this machine that's going to hoover up um, Asian um, savings and, and yes. deploy them um, and that the UK would make a lot of money out of it. And on the basis of that assumption, Lots of people in the British security and intelligence establishment have got very close to Chinese companies. There are a lot of um, ties with the, with the Chinese government. And America is now forcing Britain to choose. And Britain is trying not to answer the question, maybe until it gets a new prime minister, but just sort of hoping that the question goes away. But I get the impression from you that the question is not going to go away, that America is going to want an answer soon. It's, the question's not going to go away, but I want to fight your premise that it's the United States who's forcing Britain to choose. The United States is simply forcing Britain to acknowledge that China is not respecting the rule of law, that Chinese companies are an extension of the Chinese security state, that those Western companies and Western governments who participate in Chinese technologies are at risk of, of um, the Chinese using them for surveillance purposes in the West, for compromise of the integrity of Western civil society, Western elections. Um, so we're not forcing Britain to choose, we're forcing Britain to acknowledge they're making a choice. How fractious could this get, do you think? I mean, if, if the British who are, it strikes me, being very British about it and attempting to, to fudge the issue and the hope that something else turns up. What would America do if Britain um, decided, decided to go with Chinese technology? Is it melodramatic to think of it in terms of it's that or it's the Five Eyes um, key relationship on, uh, secu on, on security and intelligence that's at stake? Yeah, I, I think it was injudicious of my government to throw out publicly that if Britain goes with Huawei for 5G, that that will make Five Eyes intelligence sharing untrustworthy. I think uh, we are still going to need a lot of help from the British. What I think the administration should have done is said, this makes a whole bunch of things harder, and we're going to have to work together to figure out how to manage this. But the problem of a rising China isn't going away, and it's not just rising for the United States. So for a country like Britain, who, who has its values so central and so visible in its policies, I, for example, think the British government, if it makes a choice to go with Huawei on 5G, 
is going to have a domestic policy problem when civil society in Britain looks at the pictures of those young people in Hong Kong protesting against the law that would allow them to be extradited to China um, and allows the extension of the repressive Chinese surveillance state to Hong Kong. I think the British people are going to feel uncomfortable with that. My preferred way of managing a rising China is actually using the tools of a free society. So transparency, the rule of law, the kinds of things that, for, for example, your point about the British government making a bet on getting rich, that with Chinese money, that only works if you have the rule of law, right? And Britain clearly does, but if Chinese money comes with the corrosion of the rule of law, that would be a much more difficult trade-off for Britain to make, and that has nothing to do with the United States uh, forcing a choice. We have all sorts of levers of creative power that we're not yet engaged in using, and as the challenge of a rising China that tries to chip away at the rules of the current liberal international order, we've just got to get creative enough to use the tools that are our actual strengths. How do you see it in terms of Europe more broadly? So uh, you have, you've mentioned NATO and this recurring idea that NATO is, at, is under threat or at risk or weakened. But isn't that true at the moment? If you look at yeah. German attitudes towards Russia, German defence spending, um, what's happening in, in Eastern Europe, the determination of the French to prioritise the mythical European uh, Union army, Britain separating um, with Brexit, but also then still trying to maintain security and intelligence links with the French. It looks like a very messy um, uh, picture, doesn't it? It doesn't, it doesn't yes. radiate strength and um, consistency and, uh, you know, as, a, as a group of allies. You're exactly right. And yet, in what year were those things not all true, right? 1949, that's true. 1956, that's true. 1961, that's true. 56, during Suez, that's true. Right? I, the nature of free societies allying themselves to each other is hard. We all have domestic politics. We all um, have varying interests. It, what is not surprising is that there are continuous tensions in this transatlantic uh, defense arrangement. It's not at all surprising that there are tensions, and those tensions are consistent over time, right? The French love themselves in grandeur. Um, that's, that's a problem for us all, always. Um, but uh, my institute, the IISS, just did a big study trying to put a price tag on European strategic autonomy, right? What President Macron sweepingly describes as, as something Europe can and should do right now. If NATO's European allies had to replicate the military assistance they get from the United States, even in limited contingencies of a Russian incursion into a NATO country, so not a full-scale war with Russia, limited contingency, we did the numbers at the IISS, and it's about $354 billion. And it would take Europe roughly 20 years to build the capacity that the United States militarily provides now. So it's not going to happen anytime soon. Moreover, uh, grandstanding by French presidents uh, it is, again, nothing new. Uh, and we have the means to deal with those frictions. If you had been asked in the year 2000, uh, whether the United States would be able to persuade NATO allies to fight a war for 20 years in a remote part of the world that none of them felt threatened by, and in those 20 years there would be no visible progress in that war, and yet everybody was going to hang in there, would you have taken that bet? I wouldn't have. Mm. It's a, it it's a, a really good reminder that, that we're talking about China, we're talking about the state of Europe, but the consistent factor in the last 20 years is that 
conflict, and it's now mutating post-Islamic state, and it's a security and intelligence potential nightmare that I, I don't think people have really quite grasped yet in broader public opinion. Um, that surely, though, is, a, is, is really going to require, the next time that that flares up, whether it's in some form of an attack or some new mutation of Al-Qaeda, an Islamic State, only America can really lead on that, can't it? It's going to have to be, it's going to have to lead again, whether it's Trump or whichever, I think, whichever president. I think Europeans and the United States are most comfortable when the United States leads in those circumstances. You know, when Bill Clinton was newly installed as the American president, Warren Christopher, his secretary of state, went on a European tour because America's European allies were agitating to get involved in the Balkans. And the Bush administration, President Clinton's predecessor, had been opposed to NATO or the United States getting involved in the Balkans. So James Baker, the secretary of state, famously says, we don't have a dog in this fight. Um, so Warren Christopher, the new Secretary of State, goes to Europe to talk about what do you guys think we should do in, and the Clinton administration thought this was how America's allies wanted to engage with the United States. As equals, let's develop a policy. And it scared the hell out of European allies that the United States showed up and didn't know what to do. Because what European allies actually want from the United States is for us to have identified common problems, so problems Europeans have a stake in as well as the United States, to have thought our way through what the alternatives are and made a sensible choice. And then to come to Europeans, explain our thinking, and explain what we together ought to be doing. That's the nature of the transatlantic uh, bargain on security. Whenever any of us get scared, the United States or its European allies, we pull together. So the fractiousness that's the nature of the relationship is inversely proportional to the threat we are feeling at any given moment. You're ultimately pretty optimistic about American power and about rebuilding or, um, or strengthening the American-led I really world order. Am. I actually think the, the drivers of American dominance in the international order the creativity of our economy, the loud, uh, tiresome, fractiousness of our politics, which are actually the operation of a political marketplace, right? Where people argue about potential solutions, try them, see what fails, see what works, and try other things. We Americans and our close friends in the world have a tendency to assume other societies can do what we do and then we envy what they do better than we do, right? The Chinese are great at planning high-speed trains, and we Americans can't ever get there. But the reason we can't get there is environmental concerns, safety concerns, property rights, um, communities not wanting a 400-mile-an-hour train running through their neighborhoods. Getting those things right will be so challenging for societies that aren't free I don't think authoritarian China can actually continue to be innovative, continue to be prosperous, continue to keep talented people as Chinese citizens if they don't limber up and become more liberal. So that makes me hopeful both about American power and about the international order. You know, we're, people are worried about the order and America's liberal allies are actually doing a pretty good job of stepping forward and saying, we believe in a rules-based order and we are willing to defend that order. On that optimistic note, Cory Shackey, thank you very much for joining us. It was a great pleasure.